We are so glad that you're here. And our session today is brought to you by B2G Victory and RFP School Watch. And we're gonna focus on how to grow your business through government contracting. And maybe you're new to this space or maybe you've been in this space for quite a while and still have some questions. Well, we're going to give you answers. So get ready to grow your business through government contracts with B2G Victory and RFP School Watch. Our session today is going to cover different types of contracts and procurements. We're gonna help you understand common ab abbreviations and acronyms, the players and their various roles in the government contracting space, as well as discussing available certifications and how to benefit from them. I'm Julie Hartman, one of the co-founders of B2G Victory, and our mission is to do meaningful work. And our work is meaningful to you because your business means everything to you, your industry, your family, your neighborhood, and most importantly, your community. We're driven each and every day to have a social and economic impact by building capacity, increasing your access to capital, driving revenue, and financial stability for your company. B2G Victory offers a suite of various services from certifications and recertifications on the federal, state, and local level, capture management, which might also be known as business development, helping you find opportunities and executing the strategy of that. Once you find that opportunity, and maybe it might be from one um, of the bids that you get from RFP School Watch, we can help you respond to that opportunity with your proposal strategy, your proposal library, and helping it from, from all the way from start to end, um, and helping you with vendor registrations. And once you found that opportunity, how to have that interview with the buyer to develop that relationship. And if you've been in this space for a while and are looking for um, process improvements and ex the execution and implementation of industry trends and best practices, we can help you out with that as well. And if you have a specific need, we can help you with training and coaching, whether that's one-on-one one -on -one or within a group environment. Today on the session, um, you've got three of the B2G Victory team members, myself, Julie Irvin Hartman, um, Susan Repka, who's also a co-founder, and Emily Kelly, who's our project manager. And Emily's going to be supporting uh, throughout the chat, answering questions, monitoring the chat, dropping in. Um, helpful links as well. Um, and you can connect with us on our website through email or, you know, maybe every once in a while, you just pick up the phone and do things the old fashioned way and give us uh, a phone call. We've built a victory portal based on proven strategies with decades of government contracting and helping you win. And so we're going to talk about this portal, which will help end your frustration, help you penetrate the GovCon space and build your capacity. And for being here today with B2G Victory and RFP School Watch, um, you'll be given a 70% discount code. Um, so make sure to put in RFP um, SW right there. Um, if you wanna become a Victory Plus member on the portal, and instead of $850, you'll get it for $255 for the entire year. And our partnering agency and company with us today is RFP School Watch, and they've been a part of this Insight to Success series since the beginning of this year. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy with RFP School Watch to inform you of all of the great things that they can do to help you grow your business in the government space. Hi, Julie. Thanks so much. I'm so excited to be here today. So here at RFP School Watch, we're helping our clients win bids and grow their business in a few different ways. Uh, one of those ways is by customizing um, their accounts to capture the bid opportunities that are the most valuable to them. Um, if you can move on to that next uh, slide there, I'll just go through these things here. We're giving our clients a centralized way to access RFPs. Um, we're monitoring thousands of institutions every day. Um, as you know, that would be very difficult to do uh, individually, uh, but we're doing that for our clients, pulling those RFPs to one location and then distributing those bids daily through email bid alerts. 
um, we're allowing our, our clients um, access to unlimited bids and the ability to filter and search according to their preferences. Um, and also giving our clients priceless data insights um, into their market sector and other market sectors. Um, finally, as you see here, we're providing these, um, we're joining with B2G Victory to provide these networking opportunities, but also educational resources um, and equipping our clients with uh, education about the RFP process. Um, so if you have not registered for free samples, um, you can do that today by going to RFP School Watch. There will be information put in the chat section. Um, go register for samples. Uh, we'll provide those for you at no cost and no obligation to you so that you can get a snapshot of what we're seeing in your market. Um, and also, if you've received your samples, but you're ready to take that next step, uh, you can save 10% on your first year um, here with us um, by putting in that promo code you see there on your screen, Web10. Um, we would love to work with you. Um, thanks so much for being here today. And thank you, Julie, and B2G Victory. Absolutely. And we've been working alongside RFP Watch uh, for multiple years, um, helping different companies be successful. And we've been doing these sessions since the beginning of this year, this Insights to Success series. So if you haven't been able to, to join us previously, all of the sessions are, are on our YouTube channel with many other videos as well. Um, so make sure to go to the B2G Victory YouTube channel, go to the Insights for Success playlist, and all of the sessions going all the way back to March are there. And while you're there, make sure to subscribe. So um, as we update and post new videos, you'll you'll get notified as well. So let's go ahead and, and get started and, and jump into today's program. So if you haven't already, back to that networking that Amy talked about, um, which is one of the benefits of this session, put your contact information um, in the chat, and then we're going to use the Q&A box uh, for any specific questions that you have over the content that, that we're covering. So let's go ahead, and Susan's going to start us off with our first section and talk about the difference between formal and informal opportunities. All right, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited. Um, today is going to be a great day. So I see people are dropping their information into the chat. Thank you very much. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the formal versus informal process. Because you know, sometimes people look at government contracting and go, you know what, I that's a little, you know, challenging right now. Maybe we don't have the capacity. There are ways to do this on a smaller scale. So the formal versus informal. The, the dollar amounts may change from, from entity to entity, but this is just sort of an a overview. So the formal process is going to be um, dollar amounts that are over $50,000. And you're going to have to put in and, you know, respond to an RFP, an RFQ, an IFB. And Julie's going to go into that a little bit later. And they may have small business goals with on those contracts to subcontract out work. With an informal bid, it's anything under $50,000. That entity, that school district may need to get three quotes. That's it. If they have a small business program, one of those quotes has to be from a small business. So a very smaller pool that you're competing against. And you know the great thing, whether it's a formal or an informal, when you get paid, that check cashes the same way. So now we're gonna go into a little bit more in depth to the informal process. And then Julie will come back in and talk about the formal process. So each government entity, as I said, has their own um, policy of what's formal and what's informal. So you do need to go to that entity 
usually it's on their website, their procurement process, and it will explain that. But let's say it's, you know, an informal bid and they're only asking for pricing. So all you need to do is provide that quote. Sometimes they want you to send in the quote, email, fax, or sometimes they'll just take it over the phone. They just need a price. And again, often if they have a small business program, one of those entities that they're going to call to get a quote must be a small business. So one of the benefits, they're faster. There's no, you know, paperwork in this response that you have to, you know, submit that may be a 45 page response. All you're doing is providing the quote and they pick the best value. Now, it could be a little bit challenging because larger school districts don't have a lot of informal quotes because they are having to buy a large quantity of anything and they track it by that product or service over district wide over their year, not just this one time. Um, the, one of the benefits, it's a great way to get introduced to that entity. Give them, you know, because an informal bid has a lower risk. So maybe they're going to take, um, and then, you know, they're going to use a business that they haven't done business with in the past because it is a lower risk. So it's a great, you know, get your toe into the, to the organization. They're not always posted. So you have to be registered as a vendor and you have to start establishing a relationship with the buyer that buys those, that product or those services because they get to pick which three vendors they're going to call and get that quote. So make sure that you're registered, make sure you reach out to the buyer with your capability statement, start that relationship early. All right, so Julie's going to come up and talk about the formal process. So formal opportunities are ones that will come typically through um, RFP School Watch when you subscribe to them or when you click on that link and get the sample bids from RFP School Watch. So these are formal procurements. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we don't want responding to a bid to be a stressful experience. The only reason why you would want to pull your hair out is if you're not prepared and you're not organized, right? And that's why we started doing these um, monthly Insights to Success webinars uh, B2G Victory at RFP School Watch because we want to help each and every one of you every single step of the way. So if you have a question, you can reach out to RFP School Watch. You can reach out to Amy and Rick. You can reach out to the team at B2G Victory, or um, you can go to the portal and get questions um, as well. So we want to make sure that at any point in time, at any time of the day, you've got resources. So this world with all of these new acronyms and letters. So we're gonna go over just three most common bid opportunities, which are an RFQ, an IFB, and an RFP, and, and what these typically look like. And so an RFQ can be, um, that's typically a request for qualifications, right? And this is the procurement mechanism, a formal bid that the agency says, I need this done right? I need either this service done or this product provided. Are you able to build it, design it, deliver it, or provide it? And the great thing about request for qualifications, and you can see highlighted right there in green, is there's no price. This is 100% based on your qualifications, which is your capacity and your capability, right? Um, another acronym in RFQ might stand for is request for quote, which is price driven. But in this specific example, we're talking about a request for qualifications. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that you're going to need to respond to a request for qualifications? So when Amy and Rick send you those sample bids, 
you might get an RFQ, you might get an IFB, or you might get an RFP. So as you're going through those sample bids or, or um, an opportunity, these are the types of things that you're going to be asked for that you're going to need to have in your proposal library that you can respond quickly to. So you're going to need to have some references, possibly how do you approach a, a project or how do you deliver your product and services. You want to have some examples of past performance and the qualifications of your team um, to wrap up what an RFQ is. An IFB is an invitation for bid. This is a procurement vehicle where the agency says, I need this done, right? Or I need this service provided or this product provided. What will you charge me? So IFBs, just like in the name, invitation for bid is price driven, um, typically for commodities. So you'll, you'll fill out quite a few forms, um, very, very spec uh, detailed specifications with an IFB, um, you're going to probably need some references and you might need to provide some financial um, status and, and if you're in construction, some bonding information. So this is great when you um, click on that link and get your sample bids from RFP School Watch and, and you'll get a nice variety of the different types of, of opportunities. So the final one um, which is used the most common is an RFP or request for proposal. And a lot of people use RFP um, to mean everything um, in the government contracting space, but that's not necessarily true. A request for proposal is the, the procurement mechanism for the agency to say, I have this problem. And what they're asking for you to do is to respond with a proposal. What is the best solution? How much is it going to cost me? And can you do it? So it's it's um, the combination of, if you want to think of an RFP and an IFB plus some additional things. This is really where you want to communicate your price plus your benefits. And how does that reduce the client's risk the most? Right. And from an RFP, you can get a bid tabulation. Um, there's going to be a very structured outline of, of how you need to provide the things in the order of which it needs to be provided or uploaded. And this is really where understanding the agency and doing that research will help separate you from the competition. So when you get um, your sample bids from RFP School Watch, or if you become a client of RFP School Watch and start getting the bid opportunities delivered to your inbox, you'll start seeing the different types of things that the different agencies are looking for in the products and services that you provide and based on those keywords that you provide. So the factors to win are the same, regardless if it's an IFB, an RFP, or an RFQ. You need to do your research, and that starts today with being on the call and, and on our webinar, right? You're already doing your research on what it takes for you to be successful in the government space and being prepared. And the beautiful thing about this time of year is, is this is when a lot of the government um, 2024 budgets are released, right? So they started being released um, at the end of June, um, beginning of August, end of September and beginning of October, depending on the different type of government agencies. So now they're getting new pools of money. So do your research now and get ready. You wanna have a good reputation, you wanna have previous experience and you wanna make sure that you are offering a solution, that you're competitive in the market, that you are timely in your response and most importantly, compliant in your response. It breaks our heart to hear stories of uh, businesses that have worked weeks and days and long hours and even the weekend and they either forget a form or they think that they can submit it at 2.15 when it says clearly at two o'clock. Um, so make sure that you are compliant. Um, in this space, um, the next section that we're gonna talk about are the players in this space. And if you find an opportunity um, that might be too large for you, that's okay because you can be a subcontractor. And just like Susan said, checks cash the same way. So we're gonna talk about the two different roles that you can play in this space. 
Um, so the prime contractors and the subcontractors are, are the two roles. So the prime is the contract holder, right? So maybe you get these opportunities delivered in your inbox from RFP School Watch, and they're just too big. Well, you want to look at the specific types of scope that you know that you can provide. Then you're going to market yourself to a larger company, a prime contractor, to be a part of that team. So here's an example that a general contractor would be the project manager, and maybe in this scope of work, they need painting and sheetrock, they need electrical, and they need HVAC. So depending on if you can do the painting, then you can be the subcontractor performing that work. And back to that timely response, regardless if it's an RFP, an RFQ, or an IFB, or if you are a prime contractor or a subcontractor, you want to make sure to have these materials quickly to respond to a prime, as well as when you are responding to that bid that RFP School Watch sent to you, when you're responding to that, um, either that's at a, at a school district or a state agency, you're going to be asked for this type of information as well. So you want to make sure to have it quickly at your fingertips, a W-9, your certificate of insurance, any certifications. Susan's going to talk a little bit more about that. If you're a subcontractor, your letter of intent, any specific licenses that are needed for the work that you're going to perform, a one-page firm profile, your one-page capability statement, and then you might also need you know, your key personnel resume, your past performance. So you want to make sure to respond promptly to, to these requests. And um, just want to reiterate again that checks cash the same way as a subcontractor. Um, and this is a great way to get your foot into the door. Maybe if you're expanding your reach in government contracting, maybe you've been really successful in the K through 12 space and now you wanna to go to higher ed or you're just transitioning into the government space or you're going from state work to federal work. RFP School Watch can send you opportunities um, in the education space, municipal space, state space, as well as federal space. And if you have certifications, um, and Susan's gonna go into much more detail about that here shortly, um, when you're reviewing these bids that RFP School Watch is going to send you, whether those are sample bids or, or actual bids, they're going to have goals. And depending on the agency has different goals. So not only are you attractive to them that you are a subcontractor and perform the work, but you're going to help them hit their certification goals. And with that, I've teed it perfectly up for Susan to go into details about certification because she is the certification guru. All right, so <clears throat> I have to admit, I love certification. I have been in the certification world since about 98. And I have seen what it has helped small businesses do. It helps you grow your business in the government or corporate space. So let's talk a little bit about certification. And what is it? So we'll start with what we call um, the alphabet soup. And these are just all of the acronyms that you might see um, in a small business program. So VOSB is your veteran-owned small business. ACDBE is airport concession disadvantaged business. Hubzone is based on your physical location of your business and 35% of your employees. And if you're in the state of Texas, Hubzone is different from the state or the state of Texas as well as North Carolina's. Hub certification, which is historically underutilized business, so let's not make that confusing. Um, EDWOSB -E is economically disadvantaged women-owned business, which is a federal certification. So all of these acronyms 
are some sort of certification. And so it, it means that the company, if it's a WBE or a WOSB or EDWOSB, has at least 51% owned, operated, controlled, and is an independent business by a woman or women. An MBE or a um, is, also, is a minority owned business. The VOSB, SDVOSB means the company is at least 51% owned by a veteran or a service disabled veteran. And they, all these businesses meet the SBA's size standard. So the, as a small business. So you think, well, you know, I don't want to be I don't want to be referred to as a small business. And engineering, it's an average of, I think, 15 million over five years. You know, if you outgrow the SBE um, size standard for, you know, you're over 15 million, that's okay. Right? I think we'll all be happy for that. So one of the items on our portal is a list of all of these different agencies here in Texas or federal that do certification and a link to where you can find them. This, you know, it's certification is not get one and you're done. Certification is get as many as that apply to your business. You just have to decide who your uh, potential clients, what certifications do they accept? And that's where you start. But there are lots of opportunities for certified companies, both as prime and as subcontractors. Again, it means that you're 51% owned, operated, and controlled. And once you have that certification, you're going to go have to go out and market your company. I always tell people it's not wall art. And there you go. So while it may not be just wall art, it is you do, if you have a physical location, want to hang it on your wall. But let people know that you're certified. Put it in your signature line, put it on your website, put it on your capability statement. Let people know that you have this certification. Show up at those free bids with, with that on your capability statement so these companies know your potential team member that has the certification that and the qualifications that they need. So I know you're looking at all these certifications and going, oh my goodness, this is going to be a very time consuming process. Well, about 50 to 60% of the documents that you're going to be gathering together are applicable to more than one certification. So when we're working with a client that wants to have multiple certifications, Emily actually puts a list together. These are all the documents that you need, and these are the different certifications. And many times, like, like your resume or your passport, driver's license, legal documents, you're going to need those for all of the certifications that you're applying for. So as long as you're organized, you can get through this process fairly quickly. So who accepts certifications? What well, you have your federal. Oh, we went too fast there. You have your federal, your state, counties, cities, school districts, Fortune 500 companies, and prime contractors. They're all looking for certified companies. So that's who you're going to market to with your capability statement and those certifications. They're important. Because all of these entities, whether it's government or Fortune 500, they want their suppliers to be as diverse as their clients. So in, the, in a school district, they want their suppliers to be as diverse as the students that go to that school. A Fortune 500 company is diverse as their, the people who buy from them. 
So keep that in mind as you're looking at who you're going to target. So the federal government has a really great tool that says, am I eligible? And you can actually go through there and put your information and it's going to help you decide which certifications you are eligible for. And B2G Victory also offers a process where if you um, would like, we can go through your legal documents and some of your information and let you know which certifications you're eligible for and which certifications that you might want to um, get at a later time or what you need to do to make sure that your company is eligible. So now let's talk a little bit about some of these certifications. We're gonna go through this pretty quickly. So they're veteran owned and service disabled. So these mean that the federal government is wanting to do business with their veterans. So the veteran owned certification is if you want to do business with the VA, so the VA hospital. Service disabled veteran owned certification is now across the federal space. They're wanting to make sure that they are doing business with those individuals that served our country. So now the SBA has taken over the certification for veteran owned and service disabled veteran owned. So they're gonna make it very easy for you to get the certification. Emily's gonna drop in this link. Um, so if you are a veteran owned business, you can just follow that process and look at that certification. Now the WOSB and the EDWOSB are again a federal certification for doing business with the federal government. Um, and this came out in about 2010, 2011, when the federal government realized they were not doing enough business with women-owned and economically disadvantaged women-owned businesses. So there are about 76 different NAICS codes that qualify for WOSB and EDWOSB. And so if you have that, um, it, one of those NAICS codes, then you can get this certification and there are set-asides and opportunities for you in the federal space. You have to meet the small business standard. You have to be owned, operated, and controlled and be an independent business. So again, this is a great opportunity for you if you, um, there are some set-asides and there are some, some contracting opportunities. The SBA has made it easy to determine whether you are eligible. Um, so they have a specific page just for the WOSB so that you can put input your information and it will let you know whether you qualify. The um, federal government also has the small disadvantaged business certification. So that is any business that follows uh, falls under these um, size standard and is owned by a disadvantaged individual. And so they have different um, categories for disadvantage. So Emily is dropping that into the chat. Now, the state of Texas has the historically underutilized business and they do an excellent job of reporting out how much business they are doing with um, Women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, they also have a service-disabled veteran um, certification that you can get. So they actually report out every six months of how much business they are doing with these different categories. Now, the great thing about that is you can also find out with a little research which state of Texas agencies are not doing a good job of meeting their goals. And maybe that's gonna be one of your targets because you can provide them a service and you are certified. Florida has a small business program. So you can actually get certified with the, in the state of Florida. So they are, um, they have a veteran owned small business program. 
So a lot of different states have different programs. And so it's going to be a matter of finding out which what your state offers, what the school districts in your area offer, um, and what certifications that they take. Virginia, this is their report. This is how much money they're spending with minority and women-owned businesses. Again, knowing who's spending the money, who's actually making a effort to do business with small businesses and who's not meeting their goals is important information for you. It's gonna help you determine whether that's a target or not. Um, Virginia has a woman owned, a DBE. Um, so they have all these different certifications. So, if you're in Virginia, maybe you want to um, the small woman-owned company certification, uh, small woman-owned and minority certification. So get this the SWAM. So look at what your state has and say, okay, I'm ready to get certified. I want to to take advantage. I want to go to that pre-bid meeting with my capability statements, showing my certifications to see if there's opportunity for me. All right, Julie is going to come up and talk about our glossary. Just like Susan said, with, with all the certifications in the alphabet soup, um, there are words and phrases in, in this contracting space uh, that might be new to you. Um, and some of these are, are abbreviations and then some of these are acronyms. So we wanna make sure to set you up for success and provide you a resource to go to when you're reviewing a bid and there is a word or a phrase that you don't um, understand. And so on the Victory Portal, we have a glossary as well. And we're continuing to, to add words to, to that glossary because we wanna make sure that you have access to it anytime you or your team needs it. Maybe it's a Saturday afternoon or, or a late night on a Tuesday uh, to be successful, to understand exactly what the agency is, is looking for. And so we're gonna go through uh, just a few of these, these words and phrases. And so on the federal level, um, the system for award management, which is also called SAM, and that's SAM.gov. And so we all um, are familiar with the ARPA Act as well as the Infrastructure Act um, and how the money is coming down for Wi-Fi, roads, bridges, and other um, community development projects. Well, that's federal money that's going to come through um, local agencies, whether that's um, a state agency or, or a county or maybe transportation or a school district. Um, and so you're going to possibly, depending on how that money is flowing, like Susan said, um, might need to be registered um, in SAM. So if you are interested in doing work with the federal government, that is a must to be registered in SAM. So when you hear the word SAM in the government contracting space, that's not a person it's more than likely um, this website, which is the system for award management. All righty. A capability statement is, is another word or phrase um, that you'll hear in this space. And a capability statement is a document that summarizes your company's background. If you have any relevant certifications, your capabilities, your past performance, and other very pertinent information that's necessary uh, for a contracting officer or a buyer or a prime or even another fellow small business to do business with you. And if you need help with your capability statement, B2G Victory can help you out with that. And we've got an example right there um, on the screen, the different types of information that is included on a capability statement, your contact information, your geographic reach, any industries that you serve, References, remember we talked about references there in the RFP or the RFQ. So these could be the same references. And what's great is when you're developing your capability statement or responding to an opportunity, you're going to need to use this information in multiple places. So we can't stress enough 
uh, to make sure that you have it and it's all organized. Your cage code. Your cage code is a five character ID number that, I, that the federal government uses to identify each um, company in the government space. So this is a unique code that is issued to your company that the federal government will help identify you with, right? So this is different than your taxpayer identification number. This is different than your DUNS number. This is a CAGE code, which stands for Commercial and Government Entity Code. So once again, if you're interested in doing work in the federal space, you'll need to be registered in SAM and you'll need a CAGE code. You might also see a BOA, which is a basic ordering agreement. So this is an agreement between a buyer and a seller that sets the terms, specific um, specifications regarding the goods and services to, to be supplied. So this is not a contract. It is an ordering agreement, right? And so back to what Susan was talking about with these informal opportunities, you might be responding, um, a contracting officer or procurement person will send you possibly a BOA to have you write down the terms, what you're going to be providing. And then from that, it goes into a contract, right? So different steps and different forms and different tools that agencies can use to procure your goods and services, whether that's on the formal or informal level. A CO um, doesn't uh, stand in this space for the abbreviation for Colorado. It stands for contracting officer. In this, you could um, use interchangeably with the buyer, with the procurement director, with um, a, a purchasing officer. These are all of the same types of people in different agencies. And this is the primary point of contact. This is the person who will represent the agency, whether that's at the state, local level or school district, that will be making the decision and that you'll be going back and forth to. And so you can see here on this um, example, there's was a primary point of contact and you might even have a secondary point of, of contact on a pursuit. Um, so this would be the person that you're gonna send questions to. This is the person that if you have questions um, about the bid, and also, when you get your sample bids from RFP School Watch, it'll have that listed. So maybe that sample bid is passed, right? And it's, it's historic. That's okay. There is tremendous value in those sample bids that Amy and Rick will send to you because you now have the contact information for the contracting officer or the purchasing person. And now you know the types of ways that this school district procures your goods and services, and you can call them up and see um, if there are any informal opportunities in addition to the formal. So great value in getting those sample bids from RFP School Watch. The FAR um, stands for the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and this is a set of rules that government agencies must follow. And this is on the federal level, and so we wanted to show this to you, but when you're doing your research or you're responding um, and looking through that sample bid that you're gonna get, um, it will tell you the link to that respective agency's purchasing policies. It is so important for you to go and research that. So if you're doing it on the federal level, you're gonna go to the FAR, but if you're doing it on the state or local level or a school district or higher ed, each school district, each federal agency, will have their purchasing um, documents and their, their, their purchasing processes and procedures. Um, we wanted to make sure to show you this. This is the Federal Procurement Data System, the FPDS. Try to say that fast, really quick, right, three times. And this um, is on the federal level, but what it does is it will help you get information um, on policy and trends. So you can go to the FPDS, put in uh, the keywords and you can start seeing um, policy and trends for the types of goods and services that you provide on the federal level. Mm -hmm. Then um, we're getting ready to wrap up our glossary section. 
And we wanted to talk about NAIX codes, which stands for the North American Industry Classification System. You might be familiar with NAIX codes when you do your taxes, right? There's that one NAIX code that goes at the top of your taxes. Well, in this government space, you're not limited to just one NAIX code. So after you send your keywords to RFP School Watch, go here to census.gov slash NAICS code and put in a few more of your keywords because many of us provide multiple services and provide multiple products. So when you're doing your NAICS code search, think about where the greatest opportunity is in this space. Think about your largest profit margins. Think about maybe where you have the resources and scale to grow and order your NAIX codes when you're registering yourself um, and, and when you're submitting to a bid. Also, when you get those sample bids, they will have the either respective NAIX code or the NIGP code or codes that tie to this opportunity. So um, when you get those sample bids and you see those codes, and make sure that you have those listed as well. So in closing, taxpayer identification number, you're gonna need to know your TIN. Um, and, and so you should have that on your W-9. And in order to register in SAM, you're gonna need your, your TIN. Um, and you wanna make sure that if you're doing work in this space, regardless if it's on the local, state, or federal level, um, we highly encourage you to get an EIN or a TIN and not use your social security number. Well, we've covered a lot of information in our August session um, for our insights for success. And just as fellow small businesses, we value your time and we wanna make sure that we are providing actionable items for you that you can use either later this week, we got a few extra days left here, right? Left in this week, uh, things that you can implement next week, or maybe we've covered some, some long-term goals for you within your business that you might wanna push um, into the next quarter, maybe you know, fiscal quarter two in the government space, fiscal quarter three or fiscal quarter four. Um, we wanna continue to do these sessions for you and we want your thoughts. Um, so please, with the extra minutes that we have left today, fill out the survey. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know um, what your challenges are and your struggles or maybe future topics that you'd like uh, for the B2G Victory team and the RFP School Watch team to cover. I'm going to pass the, the mic back to Amy and let her have some closing thoughts uh, for you on, on RFP School Watch. Thanks, Julie. Um, yeah, so thank you all for attending today. It was great um, being here with you all today. It, again, if you've not registered for samples, be sure to use that link over in the uh, comment section. Go register for samples. Um, I'll get those samples over to you today, Rick or I will. Um, and again, if you're ready to move forward, you want to start getting these bid opportunities every day as they're posted um, in your state or across the nation. Um, be sure to use that web 10 promo code on the screen and um, we would love to work with you. Um, thanks so much. If you have any questions, let us know. Awesome. Does anybody have any specific questions for Amy and Rick with RFP School Watch right now? Well, we want to reiterate uh, that, that we thank you for your time and being here. And um, we're offering um, to use the, the code RFPSW to get that 70% discount. Um, and you'll be able to access the Victory Plus membership level for only $255 for an entire year. Um, Emily, thank you so much, Emily, for all of your help dropping all of all of the, these these knowledge bombs and, and, and links in, in the chat and all of the great information. So make sure to, to join us at the Victory Portal. Um, and we're here today, but we've got other sessions and other resources available for y'all. So obviously more education equals more wins and that's what we're all about. So we've got some in-person as well as virtual events coming up. 
Uh, next week, the um, Houston Independent School District is hosting a session in person if you're in the Houston area on August the 30th. Then we've got um, the behind the scenes tour of the BDG Victory Portal on August 31st. We'll come back and you can join us in September uh, with RFP School Watch on 10 ways to grow your business with government contract. That's gonna be a rapid fire uh, session. And then later that week, um, we'll conclude with our September uh, B2G Victory Portal. But those aren't just the only events that are going on. So on our website are tons and tons of events. And this is just a screenshot of, of the events that are going on in September. So we encourage you to visit the events page of our website. And the events page that's on our website is also um, on the portal. So two different ways for you to continue your education and and continue growing uh, your company, growing your capacity and, and, and winning, right? Because that's what it's all about. Give us a couple days to um, download this recording and um, get it uploaded on our YouTube channel in the Insights for Success playlist. Uh, we'll email that link directly to you. I saw a couple of comments um, in the chat about, um, do you get the slides? Um, and, and this, like we said, um, the session is being recorded just like all of our previous sessions are up on the YouTube channel um, in the Insights to Success uh, playlist right there. The B2G Victory team um, is here to help you in any way possible that you would like. If you want to um, jump on the phone, if you want to schedule an appointment with us, if you want to follow us on social media, uh, please do. Emily's dropping in all of our contact information um, and make sure to also reach out to RFP School Watch on their social media um, and stay abreast with them on all of the great things that they're doing as well. We've got a couple more minutes left in our time together. We want to um, see if anybody wants to drop in maybe one or two nuggets of knowledge that they're going to walk away with and implement immediately. You know, in our previous sessions, people have, have commented that um, the importance of being organized as well as being able to, when you get that sample bid, go through it and have a better understanding of what exactly agencies are looking for uh, without the pressure of having to hurry up and, and respond. Um, so those are some of the things that, that previous attendees have, have mentioned that they've benefited from the session. Amy, do you want to talk a little bit more about the, the sample bids that, that they can get from y'all? Amy? Hello. Sorry. There was no volume there for a minute. I apologize. Uh, what was the question? So you want to maybe go into a little bit more detail about the, the variety of sample bids that, that you send to people? Sure. So um, whenever people register for samples, they're providing us typically with a few keywords that best represent their services and products. Um, so from there, um, they may also indicate whether they want uh, samples from the K-12 space, uh, the higher ed space, or uh, state and local government, um, or all three. So um, whenever we go in and we search for samples, we're looking for um, those bid samples that would kind of give you a snapshot of what we're seeing in your market sector, but also an opportunity to explore other market sectors and kind of see what's out there. Um, because you do get unlimited um, access to all market sectors and unlimited keywords when you activate. So it's a really great uh, way to kind of get an idea of what's going on and what people are requesting out there. So um, that's what they're going to get. And typically receive between 15 to 20 samples when we send those over. And they're both a combination of open and closed bids. Um, Julie, you've mentioned before about how there is value in those closed bids as well. So we want to give people that kind of glimpse into those historical uh, bids as well. So that's what they can expect to receive. About 15 to 20 bids. Um, bid samples in their market sector or whatever they specify. 
So that's what they can expect. That's 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 a gold mine and and worth a ton a ton of value. Um, I want to kind of just go over. Um, all right, we've got a question here in the chat. How how best would you recommend to get in the foot in the door with the school district, even though as a company you may not have past projects, but past experience, much experience is that much experience in that realm. Is it possible to get in? Um, ab absolutely, it is. And so uh, there's a couple of different ways that that you can do that. Um, an informal opportunity is a great way to do that, right? Because it, it's low barrier to entry. Um, I would also leverage maybe experience that you have before you started your company or make sure that you're able to tie the specific goods or service that you're going to do for that school district that you did a similar type of, of good or service, maybe in the commercial space space maybe in the industrial space or or in the private space because you want to make sure that what you're communicating is that you are mitigating risk that you can do the work i would also you know make sure that you've registered uh before you uh, reach out to that buyer uh with that school district um and and you've done the the research i would also go and see if you could find out um who currently is doing the type of work uh, that you're wanting to do for that school district in, in that space. So do your research, get registered, um, tie what you're doing, um, what you're wanting to do with them, with things that, that you've already done and make sure that you reiterate <clears throat> and differentiate that it is owner's experience and not the company's experience because you don't wanna misrepresent. So we have some comments here that this is a lot of great information. Um, you're very, very welcome. We will put together, we saw a, a comment um, that you're not able to copy and paste out of um, the chat. So we'll go ahead and put all of those links together in a document and we'll send that over to you when we send you out uh, the link to, to the recording for today's session. All righty, well, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Thanks so much for joining B2G Victory and RFP School Watch for, um, for our August Insights um, to Success webinar. We hope to see you in, um, in oh, September. Sure. Yes, <laughs> in September and online um, and anywhere else that you'd like to connect with us on. on and if you're in Houston, Come to the HISD. We're going to be talking about getting your house in order. But thank you. Any other closing comments, Amy or Rick? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that you know if you're um, if you're currently like searching multiple platforms for bids or you're trying to keep up with different school websites and and district websites that um, a lot of people have said you know that one of the things that they love is that they're saving time. Um, by using our services. As I mentioned earlier in the session, you know, we pull everything together in one spot for you to save you time and uh, just to be able to uh, give you more time to do other things that matter. Time is money and we want to um, uh, be a valuable uh, resource for you uh, in source of valuable bids. So if you're looking to save time and save money, this is a great way to do that. So we would love to work with you. If you have any questions, give us a call. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you.